did you are and mm -hmm. where you're from? My name is Marion Carter Bell, and I am 90 years old, and I am from New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, anything <laughs> else? Tell me about how, what it was like growing up. What was your hobbies? What were your interests? You know? Oh, I always loved to cook from a small child. Uh, my mother was a good cook, and I learned a lot from my mother. And I used to, we grew up very poor because it was during the Depression when I was a child, and times were really, really hard. And my mother used to get commodities, is what it was called now, like food stamps, I guess it is now. And uh, she would get like flour and butter and eggs and milk. And I used to be in the kitchen. I was about maybe eight, nine years old. And I used to love to make tea cakes. And everybody loved my tea cakes. And that brought attention to me, <laughs> so I was just so happy to make everybody else happy. And my mother would come home lots of times, and she was upset because I had used all her butter and her eggs. <laughs> but it was still fun growing up. Tell me about the time um, the opportunity came um, to join the military. Um, I was working when I graduated from high school, uh, I didn't, uh, wasn't able to afford college. Back then, they didn't have grants or all the programs and everything they have now that you could make loans and, because this was way back in the 40s. And uh, I got a job working in a clothing factory because it was one it was a union job and it paid a pretty decent salary and I was able to get my own apartment and pay my bills and take care of myself and be on my own and live independent is what I wanted to do and I stayed there but ever so often uh they would have, I worked for Haspel Brothers, was the name of the clothing factory. And they made Brooks Brothers, mainly seersucker suits. Do you remember the seersucker suits? Probably be, that was before your time. And uh, we had other, uh, some type of uh, something with a nylon and a, a rayon something. Uh, kind of suits, but uh, seersuckers was one of Brooks Brothers' main suits that they sold. A lot of businessmen, lawyers, and attorneys, you know, they this is what they normally wore because it was hot and air conditioned wasn't like it is now. Everywhere you go is air conditioned now, but back then it wasn't. And they wore the seersucker because it was a lightweight and it was cool. And but ever so often business would become a low. We didn't have very much work. It was a union job, but still, when they didn't have the work, it was nothing the union could do for us. Uh, so I decided to go out and find me maybe a little part-time job until the work picked up. And I did, one, I was reading the Warren ads, and during segregation, uh, they had an ad in the paper that read, a light complexion colored girl wanted. I did not think that I was quite light enough because I had relatives that looked like you, like Caucasian. So I just said, well, I'm desperate. I'll go and try and I'll apply. All they can do is turn me down. But I went and they did. The guy hired me. He had a shop in the French Quarter. And I enjoyed working there and 
He taught me the ropes. Sometimes I would work the register and wait on customers, and I would tidy up the place. And until finally one day, he came to me and I told me, he said, Marion, I think I have a great idea. I said, oh, what is that? He said, I would like to start selling plyrenes. And I said, well, I think, you know, that will really draw in a lot of customers because uh, in New Orleans, they made wonderful plyrene. It's a little candies you call them probably uh, plyrenes, I think. Plyrenes, yeah. The, uh, but the, we the call plyrenes. them plyrenes in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, and I decided, and in a showcase, I'm going to have like an Aunt Jemima a lady in the window sitting in a rocking chair with a basket like she's selling the plyrenes to customers. Oh, I said, well, that sounds good. And he said, and I would like for you to be Aunt Jemima. I said, well, I said, if you want me to be Aunt Jemima, I said, I think you should put another ad in the paper. I said, because when I came, you were looking for a light complexion colored girl. I said, what are you going to do, blacken my face to make me look like Aunt Jemima? And I was just so upset with him. I just got my purse and I walk out and I just quit the job then. Uh, and I waited and waited around and I saw an ad or read about an ad about the military. And somebody told me that the Air Force was a wonderful place for young women. And I did, I didn't know if they would accept me, but I was desperate and I decided to go and apply. And sure enough, I went and I took the after two tests, I passed the test and the, a few other things I had to do. I can't remember everything, but everything went through and I was accepted into the Air Force, and I was so happy about that. And uh, I didn't stay in very long because uh, after I was there about a year, uh, my husband, I met this young man and we started dating and then we eventually got married. And after a while, they was sh they shipped him to another base where I was Air Defense Command, and they did not have Air Defense Command where he was going. So I was not eligible to go. I couldn't transfer with him. And I had, uh, I did not go to tech school. I did my, I had what was called OJT, on-job training. And I was a radar, they said we were radar operators. I was nowhere near the radar, but we worked in the control center where uh, it's like a movie theater uh, and all the big wheels would sit where the audience normally sit in a movie theater, and we had to learn to write backwards so that what we wrote, they could read. And uh, radar would call in information to us, especially when we, uh, they, we plotted and an aircraft was going into our radar and they hadn't identified themselves. Uh, we, we immediately started using different color coded colors and everything and ring a bell to get the attention of the officers that were out there so they would all uh, pay attention to this particular aircraft. And they would notify SAC because everywhere uh, 
we were, SAC was always there. And uh, they would uh, give, I can't remember if it was how many warnings they gave this particular aircraft uh, that they were in our airspace and they had to get out. And if they didn't, SAC was on their way. And uh, most of the time, it turned out to be little crop dusters. They would be out spraying at night, I guess, and sometimes they would get carried away and not paying attention, and it would run and tip our radar. But it was very interesting. I really enjoyed every minute of it. But after they transferred my husband, I couldn't go where he was. So I was eligible for a discharge. So I just uh, got my discharge and we moved to Wichita Falls, Texas. And uh, I really miss it. And I miss the marching and the drilling, the things that we thought were just, we were tired of it in the Air Force every day. We had to march in the morning to breakfast, march to lunch, march to supper. Everywhere you went, it was a parade. <laughs> but after I got out, I really miss it. It's a funny thing how you, what you have right there in your hand, you don't realize how much you are enjoying that until after it's all taken away. And You made the decision and you say, Mom, I'm going to join the Air Force. What's your mom's Oh, one second. well, she, you know, she said, uh, asked me if I was sure that's what I wanted to do because the first thing she, at, it was peacetime. We didn't, we weren't at war then. But she said, you know, if they go to war, you're going to have to go. You're going to have to go on the front lines. And I said, well, uh, I know I will have a steady income and I will be able to maybe save some money and even help her some because we were very poor and she really struggled to take care of us. And I wanted to help in you know, any way I could. And, uh, but she was satisfied with it because my brother uh, hadn't, uh, was in the Navy and he really enjoyed his stay in the Navy. Uh, but uh, no, she didn't object to me going because I was about, I think about 28, 27 or 28 years old when I went into the Air Force. So I was a woman, you know, and so she knew I had to live my life. So she just went along with it. Tell me about the women that you served with. Did you all have, did you have friends? How did you pass Oh, them? yeah. Uh, it was, and I didn't have any problems at all, except something happened the very first night when uh, we uh, got to Lackland Air Force Base. That's the main base where all the recruits go right there. And when our training instructor, we got off the bus and Later on, I don't know if it might have been a setup. I don't know what it was, or if it, if the child was actually asleep at the desk or what. I I don't know, but it could have been staged. I don't know, just to put something into our minds to let them let us know what we were could be prepared for. And the little uh, young lady that was at the desk was had fallen asleep with her head down and he knocked and knocked and she finally woke up and he chewed her out. It was terrible <laughs> the way he spoke to that child. And he said, if this had been wartime, you would probably have been put in front of firing squad. And I thought, oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> but. 
after that, everything, we went upstairs and uh, the guy that was going to be our TI, we call him, training instructor, uh, he asked us questions and talked to us, wanted to get, I guess, a little feel to know us. And then he gave each of us a little, he gave us a broom and told us to sweep an area. And we all did that. Then he gave us a little pail of water, told us to clean the floor in that area. And after, uh, when we finished, he told on the side, he said, Airman Carter, I want you to stay. I want to talk to you. And he called three other uh, young men. I was the uh, only uh, woman that was there at that, at that meeting. And he, put, uh, he asked me, where did you learn to clean up like that? I said, my mother taught me uh, how to clean. He said, well, I want you to be my barracks guard and my wing chief. And they gave me a little position as to oversee the barracks to make sure everything was clean and that all the other recruits would make their bed and do everything like it was supposed to, like up to their standards anyway. And our clothes had to be hung in a certain way. Every button had to be buttoned because if they would find one button or uh, like on your uniform or a shirt or anything hanging, you would be charged with a gig and you would have to pull KP. And so I was really good at that uh, because my, I was a, a neat freak from a child. I always kept everything in its place. And um, after basic training, uh, they sent me to Oklahoma City. Uh, and uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the base. It was, uh, but it was a big radar base. And uh, they taught us, uh, uh, we had our training right there, on-job training. I was one of the ones that took on-job training. So we were trained right there on the job. But some of them went to tech school. And after, it wasn't long before I was actually working, doing the work, because the first thing, problems we had was learning to write backwards. I did have a little trouble with that in the beginning. And many days, because we didn't have cell phones or all phones as accessible to us, and if we did, we didn't have money to pay for all those long distance calls back then. And we would write letters. And many times when I wanted to address an envelope, I had problems. I didn't have problems so much with the alphabets, but it was the numbers, the digits. That I, if I made a three, I, I couldn't remember exactly which way the three went, if it went this way or that way. But uh, after a while, you know, it all panned out. And I truly, really enjoyed every minute of it. If I hadn't got married, I, and I don't know, maybe I would have left uh, Air Defense Command, because I had put in, I, I wanted to become a, a flight stewardess. And, but the, nobody had ever mentioned anything. Uh, uh, I never heard a word about if they accepted me, if they didn't, I didn't hear anything. It was after I had gotten married, finally one day they came and told me I had been accepted. Uh, uh, you know, to become a, a, a flight attendant. And, oh, I was feeling happy. And then I thought, well, you know, I'm married now, uh, and my husband's not going to be able to go every way I go. 
And, but anyway, then they came back a couple of days later and told me they were sorry, but they could not accept me. Once you, uh, you have to be single to be able to uh, work as a flight attendant in the military. So I missed out on that. But uh, I, uh, after my husband was transferred to another base and I couldn't go where he was, uh, I decided just to get out. I was eligible to get out uh, because I didn't go to tech school. And uh, one day I, I was sitting home and I thought, I need a job. So I read the one ad and I was kind of familiar with the department stores and I saw where this, the major, it was a major department store in Wichita Falls, Texas, Perkins Timberlake. And I decided I would go there and apply. It was Perkins and another store. It was two different ones I went to. But when I went to the first one, Perkins, they said, oh, Marion, we enjoy talking with you. And we don't have anything right now. But in two weeks, uh, if you can wait two weeks, we are going to have a, a big anniversary sale. They said it'll only be for two weeks, but it'll give you something, you know, employment for two weeks. Uh, I said, well, okay. I decided two weeks is better than no weeks. And I took the job, I accepted the job. And they said, we would like for you to work in our employee snack bar. It was down in the basement. And uh, all I had to do was keep the tables clean and just keep the place tidy because they had, I don't know, you're probably not familiar with the Miss Drake sandwich machines. Have you ever heard of those sandwich machines? They used to make sandwiches and put in a machine uh, and you put your coins in and get whatever type of sandwich you wanted. And one day I thought I, I was, no, one day I was walking on my lunch hour and I was passing an A&P store. And when I look in the window, I noticed they had the same kind of bread, the same bakery that made uh, the French bread in New Orleans. And right away a bell went off and I said, oh, I knew they would enjoy a good poor boy sandwich because all I needed was the right bread because it didn't matter about the cold cuts. They all used the same ham, roast beef, or cheese, or whatever. And I went into the office and asked them, would it be all right if I started making poor boy sandwiches sometimes? Oh, they said, Marion, you mean the poor boys in like New Orleans? I said, that's exactly what, oh, they said, we would just love you, we would love you. And I did, I started making the poor boy sandwiches for them and oh, they just went. And after a while, I started kicking it up a notch. I knew how to cook and I would make chicken salad, maybe a shrimp salad different little cold sandwiches because we had a little stove, but I didn't have the pots and pans and utensils that I needed to make other things. So I just stuck with the cold things, but they really enjoyed it. And after a while, it was in the 60s then, and the store owner came to me one day and said, Marion, uh, no, in the meantime, there was a lady uh, that used to come uh, in the store all the time, a 
another one of the sales ladies that work in the linen department told me about her. She said she's the chief operator at the telephone company. And she said, Mary, she seems very interested in you. She said, please let this conversation just be between you and I. And I said, okay. And uh, she said, but she said she would be very interested in talking to you uh, because they wanted to integrate the phone company. And I said, well, this would be different, you know. So I decided one day I went over and I talked to her and she said, well, first you have to take the aptitude test. I passed the test and everything was going okay until uh, she called me one day and she said, oh, Marion, I think you made a mistake on your age. She said, uh, you have that you were born in 1928. I said, well, that is my birthday. Oh, she said, oh, I didn't realize that. Because at that time, uh, way back then, they di discriminated. With, I don't know if they did it for men. Maybe your parents might know. Uh, but they discriminated against age. If you were a certain age, they would not hire you. And they said, I was too old. I was in my 30s, and they said, I was too old. Because at that time, I think they weren't hiring uh, over 25 or something like that. But she was not satisfied with what her district manager said. So she went over his head and went to headquarters and talked to, I don't know what she told him about me, but apparently it had to be all good because he gave her the green light. And she told me, he, she said, Marion, they wave at your age. And how soon can you come and start working here? I said, I'll give uh, Perkins a two week notice. I said, and then I'll be there. And I was honored with, it was an honor for me back then because segregation was really bad back then. And to be to become the first black operator uh, with Southwestern Bell in Wichita Falls. Now, New York and other places had already integrated, but the Southern and the South, they, they just didn't have it then. But I became the first black telephone operator in Wichita Falls, Texas to work for Southwestern Bell. And it made me really happy and I was felt proud and uh, I had no problems at all. And I forgot uh, before I went to the telephone company, the store owner in Wichita Falls uh, made me, uh, asked me how would I like to become a sales lady and I was also promoted in the store to the first black sales lady uh, to work uh, because they did not hire. They, you would never see a black sales lady in a store. It was always Caucasians, no, never, never African Americans. Can we talk about the time in the 60s? Like, mm -hmm. Can we talk about the 60s a little bit? Mm -hmm. um, what was it like? Did you have... Did you participate in any marches? Did you get to see Dr. King? No, I was never, I had a cousin that was very, she was really there all the time in the marches. And even when they would beat them and kick them out and throw them out and everything. But I was busy working and I didn't have uh, the, enough time to participate and those things and because I had to work in order to support myself because my mother, I either had to do that or continue to live at home with my mother. 
and I felt since my mother had taken care of me all those years, it was the least I could do was try and support myself and help my mother some because I had another younger brother that was still at home that my mother was taking care of. And he lost his leg at a very young age. So I, I, I knew it wasn't easy for her. So that's why uh, I decided I needed a job. I needed to work. Do you think that your time in the Air Force helped you prepare for your time as an operator and learning how to, to do all that? Did... Uh, probably, but I never, I guess by me being the first, because I never will forget the store owner's name was Prothro, Joe Prothro. I think his first name was Joe, but I know the last name was Prothro. And he called a big meeting and made an announcement after I told him that I would accept the job. And he c c called everybody and told me that he said, uh, segregation, he said, integration is really here now. He said, and I own the largest department store in Wichita Falls, Texas. So I think that I should be one of the first ones to step up the plate, he said so. And we lucky that we have Marion here and Marion is gonna become our first black sales lady. So he promoted me and he told me to pick whatever department I wanted to. And I told him I would, I really liked this guy in the basement. He was Hispanic, a real nice guy. And I told him I would like to work with Pete. And he thought about it. He said, but Marion, he said, the only thing with that is, if we hiring you to become our first black sales lady and we put you in the basement, it seemed like we trying to hide you, hide you. He said, anywhere else in the store, but not in the basement. So then I told him, well, I would like to work in the linen department because I always liked my towels and everything, to, they still laugh at me because I'm still like that until today. Every towel, uh, my, all my bath towels are folded. I fold them all the same size, the same shape and stack them in rows. And it's just, I, I've just always been like that. And I know uh, my brother-in-law came to visit me in New Orleans one time and I had a in my home, I had a, a nice walk-in pantry, and I had the cans. I started with the little cans, and they went like, like soldiers, you know. And he shook his head. He said, Marin, I can't get over you. But I was just always like that. I, I just wanted everything a certain way. Are you... What do you think about the progression, knowing what it was like then, to seeing how things are about women's rights and civil rights? Are you pleased with how things are moving, or? Um, in some ways, yes, and in some ways, no. Uh, and as far as politics, I do not want to get into politics, but uh, Let's talk about women in the military. Now they get more chances to do other things, to do additional jobs. You're not just pigeonholed into admin or uh, nursing. You have opportunities for jobs. So how, what do you think of the military and the, the progression giving women more opportunity? Oh, yes. It's so much better now because I met this lady and she is a general, I, I don't remember her name, uh, a very attractive, a very small lady. She's short in stature and everything, very small, a petite lady. And she is a general, a Hispanic lady. And I was so proud, I asked her, could I just hug her? And I did when they had the big celebration for us on the 12th of uh, June when, at City Hall when they uh, had the, uh, the big, when they uh, 
had like the inauguration for uh, Women's Veterans Day here in Houston. And she's the sweetest little lady and a general that would have never happened way back when I first entered the military. So things are looking good. How did you enjoy the celebration? Did you go down to City Hall? Oh, yes. Did you think you would ever see that? Not ever. Not ever. Mm -mm. It was wonderful. It really was. What did you think of the younger vets that you met that day? Uh, we didn't get to meet very many young, I didn't anyway, uh, because a lot of them weren't in uniform, so they could have been there, and I did not know who they were. But uh, all the city councilmen, each and every one of them spoke. They had something to say, and it was really nice. The mayor was there, and he was like the MC. He uh, narrated ev the whole program and everything. It was really wonderful. It was an, a real honor to be there. And we sat there, we were there all day. And they did so many nice things for us. They had proclamations and uh, they blew up pictures. I have a picture upstairs and I'm so proud of the picture. Uh, it's about this tall, it's my Air Force picture that they blew up, put it on some kind of hard board, and it's about this wide. And I put it right outside my apartment door. I have a little railing, a white railing, and I just sat it there and up against the wall. And a friend of mine uh, put a, a beautiful, um, patriotic uh, decoration on my door and then she made a little vase with the red, white, and blue flowers with little sparkly stars and then she told me, why don't you sit your little small picture over here, what they, they call it our mailbox. It's a little, like has a little flat top and underneath there's a little area where you could slip the paperwork in and that's how when they want to give us something uh, some news bulletins or something they'll just put it in there right at our door and I she made it right after the celebration for me and I told her I will keep it there until after Labor Day <laughs> and it's still there and everybody that passes and see it tell me how pretty it is. It's really pretty.